really have a opportunity to do much of a deep dive on free energy last time so I wanted to make sure that everybody understands number one how easy it is to create energy and how easy it is to understand uh, the different types of the different ways to create energy and this is going to be very very helpful for those of you who are preppers for those of you who are uh, into um, exploring um, different technologies and things like that. I know as a hobby, I like to mess around with different technologies. I like to build things. I like to prep. I like to uh, build a lot of my preps or, or enhance the ones that I do have, uh, personalize them, doing leather work and things like that. Um, so any hobbies that you have um, that focus on, like, say, electronics or free energy type electrical um, hobbies, these, uh, the stuff that we're going to be talking about is going to be very, very help helpful towards that. Some of you guys will understand a lot of this. Some of you guys will not. But I want to make sure that everybody does understand that creating electricity is not some magical, mystical thing. Um, it's actually uh, very easy to do and uh, people have been doing it for years and if we had a situation where it was grid down something like planet Nibiru did pass uh, planet X comes by one of its moons gets too close we're hit with a bunch of debris god forbid um, or even something worse than that then uh, it's every man for themselves and if you don't have the abilities to survive a situation like that it's almost better being a sheeple and not knowing and sometimes I almost envy people who don't know what the scoop is. I, 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 I think that maybe they're living a better life. I see them out there. They're very, very happy all the time. They just couldn't be happier. They think that everything's just a nice little rosy bubble that's never going to burst. And they don't understand that bad things happened. Uh, just a generation ago, we had... World War Two, and not not a, a generation, but three or four or five generations probably have come and, and gone since then. But World War Two was, you know, my mom was born at the end of World War Two, so I understand that, you know, the the meaning of true hardships. When I hear the stories of, you know, what it was like rebuilding just our country, and we didn't lose, we won. I mean, there was uh, it was tough times to go through here because of all the people that we lost and the sacrifices that we made to uh, go into an endeavor like that so and and my family personally made to go into that endeavor so um, as many of you guys know I am only like second generation I, what I call generation is grandparents to you know children to their children um, I'm only second generation in this country my grandpa three out of four of my grandparents actually immigrated uh, to uh, the United States from Portugal when I was a young man and out of those uh, four the three who did immigrate you know did pretty well for themselves and they um, you know not that you know financially wise but I mean they became middle class and they worked hard and um, they didn't um, have to resort to the types of things that when you have a glut of uh, people here that aren't supposed to be here some of them don't they're, they're not going to have jobs because there's not enough jobs to go around the people who are here legally have taken the jobs that we had in excess and were willing to get rid of and now the ones that are here illegally are taking up jobs if they can get them uh, they're taking up jobs that americans should be getting and they're taking up the uh, you know the space that we have on the rolls as far as uh, social programs and things like that that were meant to help americans who were in uh, uh, having a, a tough time financially that were the you know food stamps and things like that are meant to help american people who aren't earning enough to feed themselves or to feed them children their children or maybe they're not earning at all for whatever reason um you know the good hard-working people find themselves out of jobs sometimes and um you know sometimes they fall in those uh tough times and those systems are there to help them but when we have a whole group of people who are here illegally 
taking advantage of those resources and sucking up those resources, there's not enough left for the people who come. So, um, you know, I, I think I'm getting off track here and I got in a rant, but, you know, I myself, my, you know, my mom and my dad were both born here. Um, and then, of course, my brother and I were born here. So uh, we are second generation born into this country. And my children, my brother's ch uh, children, um, you know, they are the third generation born into this country from our people. Um, we did have one grandfather who was um, already here. And I think he was part American Indian and part um, probably, you know, settler or something like that. He was, you know, we can't really, uh, find out that much about him. My grandmother's long gone, and, um, you know, my mom didn't really know too much about that side of his history, but it's believed that he was either, um, from, uh, Welsh, um, or English descent, um, and then, of course, he was uh, also, his last name was Alexander, and so and he also had some American Indian in him, so he, his people had been here for a while, and um, that's really my closest tie to, you know, as far back as America goes, but people have been using free energy for a long, long time, and um, I want to draw your attention just to something real quick on um, the uh, ancient alien show. It's called the Baghdad Battery. The Baghdad Battery was used to store electricity. And this was, think, was used back in Sumerian times. So this predates Christ by thousands of years. This predates, you know, Egyptian and, um, you know, all of the Roman records, Egyptian records, all of these uh, things that we consider ancient. Um, the Sumerians predate them by thousands of years. So um, the things that the Sumerians were doing were just as fantastic and just as advanced as, if not more, than the things that the uh, Egyptians and the Romans were doing. So, you know, when we look at the pyramids and things like that, we go, oh my god, that's, you know, such a great wonder. Uh, we can look back thousands of years prior to that and see wonders that were just as great and just as cool and just as good. Um, but the Baghdad battery basically was a Sumerian battery that was built from a clay pot and it had some type of matter uh, that was in it. They believe it to be some type of iron rich dirt or something to that effect and uh, it held citrus juice and they would hold of course now we know that citrus um, does produce and or conduct electricity very very well and there's actually a few videos on YouTube where you can um, you know light a uh, spark a fire using a um, lemon and things like that. So um, that's well known that citrus juice um, is a very very good conductor of electricity. So uh, if they had batteries way back when, uh, you know, 2,000 years before Christ, then electricity has been around for a long, long time, and it must not, not be that easy, uh, or excuse me, that hard to produce. Matter of fact, Nikola Tesla believed that energy was everywhere, and we just had to harness it and grab it out of the air. Now, obviously, that type of technology has been and always will be suppressed, because um, they certainly don't want the ordinary man harnessing his own electricity and, and doing his own thing like that. So uh, they have this knowledge and they've kept it secret for a long, long time. And um, what I want to do is first talk about uh, generators. And so we know that free energy um, is uh, possible. Um, we've to, we, uh, in a video that I recently uploaded, I showed you guys the bloom box um, with a couple of other technologies thrown in there, the Torrid Power, which I totally think is really cool and I need to research that more because I truly believe that that is, um, from other things that I've researched, I believe that that is very possible and very capable of um, producing electricity. So we have uh, free energy and one of the easiest ways to understand this is to understand that um, a how a generator works so let's go to this is a giant generator all right so this is an alternator this is the alternator on your car and this is the easiest way to understand how electricity works basically in here there's going to be a bunch of copper wires that are round wound and 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 wound all around this like probably three or four hundred times 
this is thick gauge copper wire and in the middle of this let me grab another color here is going to be a magnet now this magnet is going to be sitting in here in the middle and it's going to be a big flat two-sided magnet but it's going to be a rare earth magnet it's going to be a very heavy magnet and when i say heavy i don't mean necessarily uh, heavy to the touch although it will be heavy uh, to the touch um, i mean that it's going to have a very heavy pull um, on both sides both north and south um, Magnets have two polar regions, just like the Earth, north and south. Uh, remember that picture I showed you in the last video? It was um, of torrid power and how the Earth uh, has north and south. Let me go. So the Earth has north and south. The polarity comes out of both sides of it. And the magnet has north and south. And the, the, polar the uh, magnetism comes out both sides of it. So as it spins within this all this copper wire that's curled over and over it creates this vortex of magnetic energy that produces sparks that come off electrical sparks that come off and are captured by this nest of um, electrical wire around it and that is harnessed and sent via two connectors now usually there's a red and a black wire that have a plug and that's how you change your alternator uh, once you get everything out of the way you just unplug the old one and plug the new one in but let's just say that we have a um and i'll show you what that looks like it's going to be a nice big it over to black real quick it's going to be a nice big thick black wire it comes off there and then it'll be a square box and then uh, it'll plug into another square just like this so uh, then you'll put the bolt back through here another bolt back through there and you've changed your alternator but um, anyway so this is your alternator on your car so all this right here is the important part right here is where the belt goes and like that all right so um, that's just an illustration of how your um, alternator works on your car so your alternator is bolted in using this bolt here and this bolt here and uh, the belt is on that comes off of your engine now the engine does the turning uh, through combustion and then by turning this this creates all the power that your your car needs to run your battery is only and this might be something that most of you guys don't know as well some of you guys anyway i know some, most of you guys will uh, probably know this but some of you guys may not know that your battery is only used during starting of your car that's it that's the only time it's used or when you have your car turned off you're running your radio your battery will die um, when you have your car turned off you leave your lights on overnight your battery will die now that's because your alternator is not which is commonly referred to also as a generator back in the day these were totally called generators alternators only came out in probably the 70s late 70s early 80s uh, they started calling these alternators and uh, the reason is they use alternating current but anyway the um this uh, the reason your battery dies is because this is not turning if this was turning it would be producing power through here to go right back to your battery to keep it powered up uh, that's how your battery stays charged is through your alternator now you can use this same setup to power anything a house this will power a house you get a battery or a bank excuse me a bank of batteries about six car batteries is what you need to power the average home six car batteries and you top it off with this full time and you will ne never ever have a problem this is a great setup with a six deep cycle batteries you'll never have a problem as long as you're not you know washing clothes and and you know running computers and the tv and everything and vacuuming all at the same time you won't have a problem you got to be kind of smart about it now maybe you need a little bit bigger size generator than this maybe you need a little bit more of an industrial truck generator uh to run your home and that's fine but i'm just telling you that this generator right here common generator off any car will run your home and you will notice very little difference from the life that you're living right now so um, now that we understand that this is a small generator off a car and how it works, it simply works by turning. Uh, that's all we have to do is turn this. Now, you've seen people set a bicycle up on this, and they'll put a, a bicycle chain over here, that, and they'll take this uh, um, 
this uh, gear off that holds a uh, four-pronged belt and they'll put a gear on there for a bicycle chain and they'll ride the bicycle and produce energy and that's one way to do it the only thing we have to do is turn this keep this turning and energy keeps being produced so one of the ways to do that is to uh, if you have a piece of land that has running water on it and we can see here all the different types of water wheels that have been built this guy has pumped water in from a creek over here to his water mill which just turns the generator on or turns the screw on the generator remember all he has to do is turn this to keep this producing energy so he tr trucks in the water on this sled here this guy has it coming on uh, I don't know, he's got some kind of strange setup here I don't really know how this works but we can tell how this one works we know that this thing probably cranks electricity out he probably has enough electricity to run uh, you know everything all at once and his neighbor's house this is no joke right here this is producing serious power uh, some of these this looks like it would produce some pretty good power uh, so this right here definitely see how he has this dammed off plus he has an extra iron fence there to keep out debris and things very very smart guy um, this is a definitely and again here on this system you can see it has a debris shield um, these people have been through it you can tell that these are experienced people who've already been through setting up a water wheel and they know you yeah, that things are going to get gummed up in your wheel so they build it the right way uh, so that things don't get gummed up in there and they're not having to go down there. Oh, the power's out in the middle of the night. They're freezing cold or, you know, they're right in the middle of, a, you know, whatever TV program or they're working on a computer and, uh, you know, next thing you know, boom, they got to go uh, fix the water wheel. So uh, you definitely don't want that. So now that we know that um, by turning the uh, middle part or the screw on a generator, we produce power so the only way we the only thing we have to do is come up with clever ways uh to do that so we know that um uh, another thing a wind farm so if we look at wind farms um you know look at how many uh, of these actual units they have out there just literally hundreds uh, turning, turning, turning continuously. This one is out in the water, which is very smart because it does stay very windy on the water usually. Um, the problem with wind power is it is not constant. And it, even though there are places where uh, the wind is usually, uh, you know, going pretty good, um, or, or there's always usually some type of breeze, I've been through some of these, driven through some of these in Northern California, and the... Uh, you'll see two or three that are turning, but then four or five or ten or fifteen won't be turning at all. So, um, you know, it's it's very uh, it's a fickle type of energy. Now, if you're using them to top up a battery system or if you're using them to enhance the grid, then this, these are perfect. Um, but I wouldn't have this as my primary system. I would have uh, maybe a water-based system or something like that, something reliable as my primary system or even a wood or fossil fuel based as my primary system and then I would have this as a backup. Wind is not um, very, very dependable. So, um, but they are, it is beautiful, it does work uh, beautifully and it is free. So that is always a good thing. Now, um, back to the generator. The generator on a windmill, um, same, very same principle. The, uh, the only thing is they attach three big long blades to this and the blades catch the wind and the wind turns this. Now usually the wind will turn a big a very big crank and they'll use different size um, gears uh, they will gear it down to where uh, a very big spin on the big wheel that has the turbines attached to it will equal 15 to 20 spins on this so this would be going really really fast producing electricity even though the windmill is going pretty slow um, so that's how they use gearing to get more power out of the uh, input that's coming in now when you have something like um, uh, permanent energy sources that's what we're looking for is permanent solutions to the problem to me the best thing is water water is there and if you can find a source that is always going to be there then you've solved the problem now you have something like the Hoover Dam so the Hoover Dam is 
a huge, huge, beautiful dam. Um, it's built out in um, Arizona. So if we jump over to Wikipedia, uh, we get a little bit of facts about the Hoover Dam. Um, the Hoover Dam uh, was once known as Boulder Dam. It is a concrete arch gravity dam in the Black Canyon of the Colorado River. It is built on the border between the U.S. states of Nevada and Arizona, constructed 1931 to 36 during the Great Depression, dedicated September 30th, uh, excuse me, September 30th, 1935 by Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Its construction was the result of a massive effort involving thousands of workers and cost over 100 lives. The dam was co controversially named after President Herbert Hoover. Um, so the dam itself, if we look at the dam, just to give you an idea of what this dam does, um, let's take a look at the diagram. So we have uh, the crest is 1,244 feet above the bottom of the dam. So you have a fall of 1,244 feet. So that's at the crest. So if the dam was down, say, 300 feet, then it would only be 944 feet. So, you know, obviously the, the dam doesn't sit at the very crest, but uh, that's just where the crest is. But, um, you know, the dam sits probably a couple hundred feet below there. So they got the Colorado River that's flowing in here. They put this dam in between this archway. There was a natural archway here and a natural archway there, and they slammed this dam in there. Now we do have another picture. Here we go of what it would have looked like beforehand. So we had just rock coming through, rock coming through. The water line would have been median between here and here. So probably somewhere right around here would have been the actual regular water line. And uh, they slammed this dam in there, added all this concrete in there, then put a bridge so people can get across. And of course, come visit and see the dam, et cetera, et cetera. But basically you have all this water that is piled up, just waiting, just hundreds of millions of tons of pressure on this dam and it's all waiting to get pushed through these little tubes to turn some turbines now not turbines but turbines um, so uh, that's what happens here this is the high side of the dam all this water is just sitting here waiting to go through these little tubes and to be pushed out through the bottom of the dam but when it goes through those tubes it's going to be turning the turbines on a commercial sized generator. So um, this commercial sized generator has the input and uh, it looks like these are both inputs uh, on two different generators because they would have outputs that flow the other way but basically these uh, what these do they're like impellers uh, the water rushes by them and it turns the impellers, which turn the turbine on the alternator. That's all it does. These are just big, giant alternators. Big, giant alternators being powered by water rushing by the turbines is the same thing that we have going on right here. The power's coming from the belt, not, not water rushing by turbines. If you had fans sitting off here and you had a hose and you were spraying that hose hard against these little fans it would turn this turbine the same way and that's what's happening right here so um, this is a very very um, I would say this is a very uh, dependable way to produce um, energy and that's why Hoover Dam has been providing energy for almost half the, the, the United States for, um, you know, 60, 70 plus years now, 76 years. Uh, so it was uh, 1939, right? So, um, or did they say it was 35? I think they might have said 35. So it was uh, 1935 that they uh, started then, um, yeah, it's like 81 years that it's been producing electricity for half the United States. It produces the electricity for Las Vegas, Nevada, and all of Southern California. So you can imagine the needs of electricity in Nevada. Everything in Nevada, if you've never been to Nevada, it's lit up with neon. Everything. I mean, anything you can think of. A bathroom sign. Uh, uh, an exit sign, everything, neon, 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 neon. Everything is run by power. Everything is air conditioned because it's god awful hot out there. Um, you know, you name it, and they are powering it with electricity out there in Nevada and Southern California. Same thing. So that they're producing a buttload of energy off of this one single dam. So imagine what that little creek in your backyard. 
uh, could do. Now, if you don't have a bug out property and, and, and you're looking at one, I would say, to me, the biggest factor in any piece of property is running water. If you have running water, you have access to running water, then you have access to creating free power for the rest of your life. And that is... <laughs> I mean, how do you replace that? You know, that, that is the single most important factor to me, I believe, in recreating uh, what we have now. Uh, we're going to need to start somewhere. And if we could start with electricity, whew, man, it's so much better than starting back in the Stone Age with flint and steel. And, you know, I mean, we can do it that way. Not a problem. But... You know, we have the understanding now. There's plenty of vehicles that will be sitting out there with alternators now. And we can string the alternators up to make them work uh, to our advantage. There's nothing to it. Um, all we have to do is turn the turbine. It, and it says it right here. I, I grabbed this image because I thought it was just... Um, you know, it says it succinctly. Magnetism, not magic. Gen generating electricity is not magic. You can do it simply by passing a wire through a magnetic field or a magnetic field through a wire, which is what we're doing in a generator. We're turning a magnet to create within a nest of wires to create a magnetic field that we call electricity. We capture it, we port it off, and we use it. That's it. Um, so now, when you get into something like, um, let's go back into these commercial generators again. Now, this is, could just as easily be a nuclear generator. All we have to do is turn these turbines, right? So this becomes a uh, giant um, generator or alternator or whatever you want to call it. But basically, uh, this is a giant power generating unit. All we have to do is turn the turbines. Now, in nuclear power plants and in um, fossil fuel power plants, we do it with either coal, oil, or uh, nuclear energy. And all three of those do the exact same thing with three different fuels. In the coal, they use coal. Um, nuclear energy, they use nuclear rods put into water. And in coal, they put coal in the furnace. And in oil, they put oil in the furnace. And all that, that does is boil water. That's it. It just boils water. And then they capture the steam that's coming off of that boiled water because steam pressurizes. If it doesn't have somewhere to go, it pressurizes. It builds up. And many of you may have experience with a pressure cooker. If you've ever used a pressure cooker, you know it cooks food incredibly fast. And it's incredibly tasty um, it, because it keeps all the juices in it uh, because it doesn't have anywhere for that steam and those juices and that moisture to go. So this is just like a pressure cooker system. All it does is it boils the water. Now whether you boil the water um, by firing it up with um, oil, by firing it up with um, coal, or by firing it up with a nuclear rod that is insanely hot, putting it in there, and this rod is going to stay insanely hot for years and years and years and years and years, and years to come. So, you know, you're going to get 8, 10 years out of a nuclear rod, maybe. And for 8, 10 years, it's going to sit there boiling water for you. You're going to capture that steam. You're going to pour it down into smaller and smaller pipes until it's coming out of there at such a high velocity with such intense force that it pushes these giant turbines that are located right in here. These turbines are right in there. The steam is being forced in here at incredible velocities, incredible speeds, incredible pressures. It's turning these turbines. These turbines have plates in them, and they're angled so that it turns it right over in the right direction, and it turns it at incredible speeds, generating incredible amounts of electricity coming out the back end. So that is how the other types of um, power plants work, and they're all working on the same principle of, again, turning that centerpiece, turning that screw on a generator or an alternator. The ways we get there uh, can be varied and different. Now, each one has its cost. Nuclear energy, look at what just happened in Fukushima. Yes, it's very clean, it's free, but not really free because they still charge immensely for atoms that <laughs> everybody owns, supposedly. But anyway, um, you know, look at what happened to the atmosphere. Look at what they're doing to the Pacific Ocean. The Pacific Ocean is damn near dead because of that 
nuclear accident that they still have not capped off to this day. The news doesn't cover it. Nobody talks about it. It's just sitting there leaking into our atmosphere, poisoning all the fish in the Pacific Ocean. If I was a Pacific Islander, I would be suing the government of Japan, suing them in world court. I, would, I, I mean, uh, how they can sit there and take that without saying boo is amazing to me. The governments are doing a great job on this cover-up because... Um, you know, people should be raising absolute cane about this, but again, that's neither here nor there. Just to say that nuclear power is very dangerous, so on the whole, I'd rather we stay away from it. I'd rather we invest in technologies like uh, water technologies, the wave technology that I showed you in the video uh, the other night. Um, that wave technology where it captures the movement of all the waves. Waves are always happening all the time. They're there. Now there's also currents like rivers that run around the ocean and they run consistently all the way around the planet and it's like an underwater river. There's been thought of placing uh, generators, little wheels, uh, in those rivers, just anchored to the bottom of the ocean, maybe 10, 15, 20 feet off the floor. They have a nice size um, generating, uh, spinning generating platform, and it generates energy and sends it back. Um, they can have those all the way around the world in this underwater river and it could produce more energy than the earth could use so the the uh, notion that energy uh, has to be paid for and found and mined and all these things is ridiculous uh, we know we could power the world uh, for next to nothing um, they just want to uh, line their pockets more. Now that brings us to the other types of energy like uh, the toroid power, the Perendev engine, uh, the magnet motor. So these things are what the normal man is doing to combat this. We are creating things that we believe or that we know and we have shown will work. And we know that uh, with one small Perendev motor, uh, that magnet motor, it can power your whole house. That toroid power, um, we showed the video on it last night, or the clip. Um, that one guy was powering just one light bulb off of it. I saw another clip where he was powering two lamps and a fan off of one torrid or one toroid. Now, again, I'm sure that it makes a difference, a, a big difference on how many coils of wire you have wrapped around there and how powerful your magnet in the middle is. But again, uh, these are things that can be worked out mathematically and you can figure out how many torrids you would need to power, say, your fridge or uh, the, how big the magnet would have to be and how many times you would have to wrap it with copper to uh, get the power enough to, to power your fridge or your stove or your dishwasher or your clothes washer or your dryer, etc., etc. So, um, you know, these technologies are up and coming and I do believe that we should definitely explore them, definitely jump on them as fast as we can and share our knowledge with each other immediately upon finding it because uh, God knows, you know, strange things happen to people who are um, investigating or working on free energy. Uh, a lot of times these patents that come up or these people who invent things um, you know, disappear quickly and their, their information disappears just as quickly. So um, if you find something, get it out there to the community and let's all work on a solution together because you know, free energy is the key to world peace. It is the key to opening a new world, a true new world order where people are no longer fighting against each other for resources, where people are no longer fighting against each other for uh, the basic necessities of life. This would be a world where everybody is provided the basic necessities of life. Uh, you have the know-how in your head to produce your own energy. So with that know-how, uh, how much is a piece of land? thousand dollars for an acre and that's you know in in some more some of the more decent areas you can get them for 500 an acre if you want to live out in the middle of nowhere um, and probably cheaper than that in some places so 
um, you know, if you could produce your own energy on site and now all of a sudden you've got 10 acres of land and you're able to build your own home because you have the energy there, you can um, build a workshop, you can uh, uh, create things with your own hands to sell to, uh, or maybe you provide a service building homes for others or working on cabinets or you know building cabinets or whatever it is that you do. Uh, now that you have the basic necessities of life provided for you, like energy, does provide you that um, you know it's not going to provide your um, food for you but yet you could farm you could uh, you know with a well you have all the water you need with a farm you have all the food you need and uh, not only that you could sell excess back to the community or you could use it for barter um, you know and then in your spare time you could work on things to better mankind um, you know but with your basic necessities met we could live in a disto or excuse me in a utopian society instead of this dystopian society that we've chosen to live in we could change reality with our own choice if we wanted to now would people still get rich sure some people would still get rich because there's always going to be people who are going to find a way to create industry and that's called entrepreneurialism and they should be rewarded people who work harder should be rewarded if some guy, that guy wants to uh, work 10, 15 hours a week and just, uh, you know, spend time with his family and, and, and live the slow life, you know, let him. That's his choice in life. There's nothing wrong with that, you know, but then there's guys out there who are go-getters. There's guys out there who are up till 2, 3 in the morning and working on things constantly and can't sleep at night because they have so many ideas rolling around in their head. And for those guys, let them be rewarded for their hard work, you know. So uh, merit is, and I've said it many times, merit is the litmus, te litmus test for all humanity. Uh, if you judge anybody by anything other than their merit as a human being, then don't respect that. Um, I respect merit. I don't respect skin color. I don't respect nationality or uh, religion or creed or any of that. Um, I respect uh, a man who's worthy of the title, a man. Uh, someone who takes care of what he has to do. Someone who uh, is as good as his word. Someone who goes out on a limb to help people. Um, not this self-centered, wimpy you know, whatever passes for a man these days is terrible, but I don't want to get on my soapbox and rant. Anyway, I just wanted to make sure that we all understood free energy and what it truly is, uh, what over unity is, you know, and I think the best, um, I, we, t we touched on it uh, in the video I made a night ago or two nights ago, but I think that the best example for over unity might be the Archimedes sphere uh, because it shows even 6,000 years ago we had enough knowledge to know that by floating a ball within a ball of spinning water uh, we could create uh, a never-ending cycle of energy. Now, how much energy can we, uh, and over unity, what over unity means is that there's enough to turn the ball, there's enough energy to keep the ball turning, plus there's a little bit left over. And that little bit left over is what we siphon off and use to turn the turbines. So if you um, ramp up Archimedes sphere from uh, the small version that you see in the video all the way to an industrial size version, and you kept that rolling, um, you know, how much electricity could that produce? And, uh, you know, maybe if you had 10 of them, 15 of them in one location. That, to me, is the absolute goal of free energy. Uh, or n not only do we have free energy, but we also have no emissions uh, coming from that. You know, um, coal and um, wood fires, oil fires, and things like that, they leave uh, a residue. They, you know, it's not like nuclear power. Nuclear power was thought for a very long time to be clean power, but we know that right now that it's not clean power, that when it goes bad, it goes bad in a very, very, very bad way and kills half your planet's ocean off. So, and we're dealing with that. We're going to have to deal with that for the next, you know, 50,000 to 100,000 years. You know, that's not going going anywhere. It's only going to get worse. Um, you know, we can try and ignore it as much as we want, but, you know, uh, we're just passing the buck to the next generation on that, too. So, 
<laughs> but again, I don't want to get on my soapbox. I just, I just want you guys to understand that free energy is out there. It's possible to make it clean and affordable and to be able to do it yourself. Anyway, now that you understand, or that we all understand that, now we can move forward and talk about these free energy devices, specifically like the Toroidal Power, Power Unit. And I do believe that that has a lot of potential, and I look forward to studying that a little bit deeper. So anyway, with that said, I've talked your ear off enough. I thank you guys so much for listening. And again, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for being awesome. And please like and subscribe. Tell a friend. If you have any other suggestions, any other things you'd like to talk about, please let me know. I will be more than happy to do some research on it if I don't know about it or to discuss the subject with you either personally or uh, we can do it on a show or something like that so have a great day and we will talk to you